Welcome to PM Express Business Edition. In times like this, when the economy is struggling to recover from the shocks of COVID-19, what role can our development partners play in helping us recover quickly? One partner that we all cannot underestimate or forget is the UK government. In all these things, what role are they playing to aid the recovery of the Ghanaian economy in these uh, COVID times? Well, I'll say that I am privileged to have the UK High Commissioner to Ghana, Ian Walker, to find out from him what his government is doing or is willing to do for us in these times of COVID-19 when we are on the verge of recovering. But some are saying that the second wave is and might be the biggest threat to this recovery. Ian, how are you doing? Very well, thank you. Welcome. Good to see you. Good to see you too. And how are you managing in these... Uh, uh, cover times has it restricted your movement as a commissioner you need to be moving around getting stuff done how has it been for you well for sure i think it's changed um hopefully temporarily but changed the way that we work as i'm sure it has uh, you and so many uh, other people so definitely doing uh, much less kind of in big groups that doesn't happen so much at all um and certainly you know thinking back more towards earlier last year you know, really reducing very, very significantly the amount of meetings that we had. Uh, but now, I think, starting to adapt. Um, so able to have some meetings, doing it socially distanced, increasingly outside. Um, and really, I think, very kind of well aware of the protocols that I think everyone is following. Uh, but yeah, it's been a, a challenging year. I think mm. we can't pretend mm. otherwise. Yeah, has it changed uh, diplomatic work or, I mean, with the power of technology, listen, uh, the critical things are being done. Maybe the face-to-face -face interactions are off, but listen, all the critical stuff, uh, George, in my work here as a high commissioner, has been done. So yeah, look, I think in the last year, I've never been busier. Um, and I think the importance of diplomacy, by which in this context, I mean, the importance of countries working together has never been uh, more important. So we've had to adapt. I don't think it's about doing less. I think we've all actually had to do an awful lot more. Um, so yes, so much more is being done online with kind of Zoom and Microsoft Teams and all that kind of stuff. And certainly I found in my life that actually you can get quite a lot done in that way. Uh, it's almost been quite surprising actually. However, uh, nothing quite replaces physical contact, face-to-face -face contact. So, so trying to find that mix um, whereby, um, you know, we do have meetings, but we do them in a way that's socially distant, uh, but also we use technology as well. Uh, it's, it's the thing that I think we our business is adapting to, and I know many businesses across the country and around the world are adapting to as well. Let me digress a little bit. I mean, what is your thought on this whole uh, work from home? I mean, there are some who are complaining about uh, fatigue or reading online, and even some friends are engaging you as well are now complaining about work from home fatigue. Mm. Judging from what you're saying about the, what you've been able to do, even with uh, there's uh, less human interaction. Uh, what is your whole thought and argument about this mm. whole work from home? Some are calling for us coming back if, if we can contain the pandemic. Some are saying that, listen, it has come to stay. Mm. I mean, it's a great question. I mean, I think there are undoubtedly pros and cons, right? I mean, I think when I think of the advantages of working from home, I know many colleagues see the benefit of not having to commute uh, every day. The time you spare from that is great. And in fact, people have spent more time with their families, which has been positive and negative, I think, but it's mostly positive, <laughs> being with your family uh, more. So I think there's lots of positives, I think, that people have seen. I think the challenges have been, I've seen personally and others as well, you know, homeschooling has been difficult, I think. Um, creating that boundary between work and play has been kind of, you know, your work life and your social life has been, I think, more difficult. And I think how we then adapt is the key. So it does seem to me that elements of this are here to stay. And I think we've got to find a way that as we kind of adapt with COVID hopefully reducing post-vaccine, that's because we see the suppression continuing. I think it's really important that we do learn lessons from it actually, because many of the advantages that people have seen, we want to bank, we want to keep them, I think. Um, but I think the, the biggest disadvantage of working from home, I think is often that, that sense of, the kind of collegiality, the friendship that people form, the networks, the relationships you build, they are different done online than, uh, than in person. And I think how we therefore adapt without lurching back to what was before 
but kind of find a hybrid kind of way, I think, mm. is what I, it's what we're thinking about in the High Commission. That I, I know when we speak to many other organisations, they're looking at the same things. Mm. Yeah, well, one of the critical reasons why we have in those meetings looking at the, the Ghana-UK relations and at the critical time like this uh, during COVID. Mm. I mean, uh, as we speak now, how would you describe the relationship between Ghana and UK? Look, I think the UK-Ghana relationship is incredibly strong. I think uh, uh, the, the UK is super proud of the, of the friendships, of the connections, of the kind of the huge diaspora that we see between the UK and Ghana. And I think we, we continue to invest not in the country, but in the people. We really care about Ghana deeply. And my lived experience here is that the people of Ghana really care about the UK. And I, I think uh, we see it in every every walk of life. So I think I feel very positive about it, undoubtedly. Um, I think the thing that gets me out of bed every morning is a sense that we must never be complacent and that uh, actually we've got to kind of work harder on the good things and pick off some of the bits that we see as challenges and make sure that we really do build towards a kind of a, a, kind of a future where we are even more uh, closely uh, working together. And uh, you know, I think, again, COVID has brought this into sharp relief. Um, whether that's been around the work on health, where we've, you know, not just the work the government to government's been doing, but, you know, there's many kind of Brit Ghanaian doctors here in Ghana or in the UK, people with family in the UK who've been worried about family and vice versa. And I think that kind of strength of connection is, is real. But as we've talked about before, and something that I really, really do care about, is we've got to never be complacent, not take that for granted. And, and we've really got to kind of deepen things around our kind of trade relationship, I hope. And I, I think we have done that in recent years, and I want to see that continue. Deeper our understanding of each other's cultures, I think that's the fundamental basis on which we kind of grow and understand each other. And look to expand all sorts of kind of partnerships and opportunities both ways, um, so that whether that's around kind of medical workers in the UK and coming back to Ghana, whether that's around security, almost all the domains of kind of normal life, I think that the strength is there. But we've got to kind of avoid any sense of latency and really inject the energy into that. Yeah, and it's good you talk about uh, trade because I would also, before I even come to trade, just to ask you again about the fact that do you think that compared to 10 years ago, the relationship now is better than before? It's been strengthening or lessened. Uh, just like any relationship, uh, there are differences that need to be ironed out to be stronger looking at our relationship, but we just celebrated since March and mm. how the UK government has played a critical role in helping and even accepting the independence and all that. You think that today, and you happen to be in the seat as a diplomat and a high commissioner, it is better than 10 years ago? So, I mean, maybe I should be asking you that question because <laughs> uh, you, you will have a view on it as well. I mean, I, I think I, I hope, that, well, I know the relationship's in a good place. Um, whether it's stronger, I, I hope it's stronger, um, but I'm really mindful that I think often when we talk about countries, we often describe them as if they're two static things. And actually, that's not true. Both countries are changing. And we've really seen Ghana's kind of development, as you'll have seen with your own eyes and lived and worked, Ghana's development accelerating. The nature of what Ghana is all about, whilst there are fundamentals that remain the same, it's changing. You want to see more investment, bigger focus on trade, bigger focus on you know, that kind of sense of partnership. From the UK, you know, in the last few years we've left the European Union. Uh, the nature of how we engage with the world is changing. We've been through many elections, as you have in Ghana. So actually, both countries are changing. And as countries change, I think we've got to make sure that we're really, you know, investing in understanding each other, firstly. And secondly, making sure that where we have real areas of common interest, we do everything we can to kind of take that uh, one step further. And I think in the last few years, I can say firsthand, I've seen that happen. Um, and I'm optimistic that for the future, as I think for everything, the future is what we make it. Mm. And I've always said that the, the role, my role, is often a bit of a broker. It's about trying to understand Ghanaians that are looking to do more with the UK, Brits are looking to do more with Ghana. I'm really keen to make sure my door is always open and we're actively encouraging that to make that happen. I, I, I talked about the relationship because I would, some would say that, do you think that the way the two parties, Ghana and UK, handled the recent announcement of the bilateral trade agreement was uh, good enough or again it demonstrated that the relationship wasn't that smooth because it kept quite long there was a first announcement and then something else came in later and we are now trying to iron out uh, the laws for a lot of observers outside they didn't send a signal of uh, two countries that have uh, come a long way in terms of political partnership and even now 
closing that trade and economic ties? Mm. Look, I think the uh, trade agreements between any countries are, are complex. Uh, I think the fact that we managed to resolve that in the time we did is a, is a real testament to uh, colleagues on the UK side and the Ghana side to bring together which are complex technical issues into ways that kind of meet the demands of our uh, respective political leaders. I mean, I think that what the, the whole ambition of the trade agreement was around ensuring uh, the enabling of kind of tariff-free access to UK markets, as you I'm sure kind of know well, you know, the UK is one of the biggest markets for so much of Ghanaian export. In fact, you know, uh, UK-Ghana bilateral trade has grown in the last few years. It's about £1.2 billion. Pounds. Um, and that's about trade. And I th when I hear when the President talks about, as he did talk before, about Ghana beyond aid and the need for to kind of deepen that trading relationship, you know, yes, we're trying to increase investment, but let's also remember that we want to enable more Ghanaians to export, to sell their products. And, you know, we take tuna, for example. I think 40% of, of Ghana's tuna is exported into the UK market. Things like that, this trade agreement enables that to happen on a tariff-free basis. So I think the fundamentals are really important. Uh, and I'm really pleased that we now have the trade agreement in place because, as I said, it's worth remembering that the UK, having left the European Union, uh, must ensure that we continue to kind of trade. That's if we stand for anything, we stand for free trade. Uh, we really want to encourage that to kind of grow. And I think we now have that platform to make that happen. But the process kept quite long. And well, were you worried about that? Look, I think trade agreements take a very long time. You, you, I'm sure you, your readers or listeners may follow well so, but trade agreements can take often years and years and years. And in some cases, when you talk about trade agreements between big continental blocks, they take decades. Look, I think you know, we were really keen, uh, as, as Ghana was, to, to get this deal done uh, as quickly as we could, but to make sure that uh, the kind of the, any concerns, challenges, questions were ones that were addressed fully and done properly. And I think this obviously landed during a time of an election here in Ghana uh, as well. And I think that's obviously a time of big change. So I think Look, it's great we've got an agreement in place and I'm, as I said, I think it gives us a real platform to, to continue this kind of sense of how do we grow this relationship because what better way captures a sense of partnership than when the private sectors choose each other to invest in and to trade with. And, and one would say that, so now what, what next, now that this, this deal has been closed? I mean, I mean, for a normal person who works on the street of Accra or always on the trade, I just look at it as a duty-free, quota-free access and to avoid trade disruptions and exports. Is there something bigger behind this trade than what we just looking at the face of it, that oh, Ghana exports maybe a ton of uh, fish to UK and therefore because of this agreement, there wouldn't be any duties on it, quota-free, duty-free, mm. vice versa. Is there more to this agreement then uh, we so, yeah, to, that will be more beneficial as well to Ghana as the UK as well? Yeah, so look, I think that the, the challenge with trade agreements is that they can often sound a little bit abstract. Um, and as you say, you know, the kind of the man on the kind of Accra Trotro must be thinking, what does this mean for me? I think, I think the point is that, you know, when it comes to, say, bananas, you know, the UK, I think, buys something like nearly 200 million pounds of bananas mm. every year from Ghana and selling them in kind of UK supermarkets. They're the best in the world, as we all know and love. Same is true of kind of pineapple and so many other fantastic produce that is grown here in Ghana. But if, I think if you pause to think about it, you know, these enterprises support thousands and thousands of jobs. Um, and they support thousands and thousands of jobs because they're selling into a market. Um, in this example, they're selling into a UK market. Now, under normal global trade, actually, countries do impose tariffs on each other. And when you impose a tariff, that's an extra cost. And if you impose extra costs on activities, then clearly it becomes less competitive. If it's less competitive, then businesses don't, aren't kind of, don't employ the same number of people. They don't sell into the same kind of market. So there is a very real life effect, which is that the benefit and the outcome of the trade agreement is such that with tariff-free access, quota-free access into the UK market, it means that you know, those people that are selling into the market are able to do that without additional costs. And that means that, you know, that we have protected thousands of jobs here in Ghana. And, and more than that, you, know, I, you look at Ghana's kind of ambitions to, you know, whether it's in, in, in so many sectors, including in agriculture, and the UK is an active buyer, it's an active market in these kind of examples. We want to bring those two things together because that's where jobs are created and that's where markets are made. And you know, we've perhaps talked of some of these examples before, but you know, a second one I would say is around when you think of these products, Ghana looking to be much more 
in terms of the value add. So it's not just exporting produce, important as that is, but it's involved in selling kind of cut produce, it's involved in treated produce, which are kind of increasing the value of those products. That happens more and more. There's big exports from Ghana into the UK on that. So the removal of tariffs sounds abstract, it sounds a bit boring, but it's absolutely essential for jobs, it's absolutely essential for enabling businesses to plan. And as we can look forward to Ghana's plans for the next three and four years, and we'll hear you know, the President's State of the Nation address, uh, to, we'll talk about, I'm sure, you know, so much of that, um, uh, so much of the ambition for the years ahead. We will want to make sure that we are absolutely side by side on that as a partner, investing in the country, buying produce, selling produce as well, of course. Uh, but that's what partners do. And I think now as Ghana moves up the value chain, as its kind of prosperity grows, that's the direction of travel we're looking forward UK, to. UK is a, is a huge market. And in such trade agreements, what do you think Ghana should be doing to really all the businesses in Ghana here to take advantage of the real potential of the UK market that it presents? Because if you, if you compare uh, a little Ghanaian uh, farm to a farm in UK, I mean, they are well sophisticated and they, they know where to touch in Ghana, where to direct their exports to. Maybe the same cannot be said for Ghanaian businesses. So it's a great question. I mean, we're trying to do a lot of this kind of stuff through our UK Ghana it? Chambers of Commerce. Uh, who are kind of contactable with any kind of questions on regulatory types of requests. But, I mean, as you say, you know, there's, uh, there are many advantages, I think, to producing things here in Ghana. Uh, the quality of produce in certain areas is unsurpassed. And we're seeing plans for things around avocado, for cashew. You know, these are things that can be grown brilliantly well here in Ghana at tremendous value and sold at a profit in Ghana that's viable in a way that's done in a really importantly fair trade basis. In terms of what I think Ghana should be doing, I think, I think it is about the kind of industrialisation of that. I think that there are, I think people often um, assume that it's difficult to sell into certain markets, but I would always challenge that and say, well, well maybe it's difficult, but there are examples in Ghana of selling into UK markets. So what we try to do through UK Chambers is share examples of people that have done it, and maybe overcome that kind of sense of actually it's not quite as difficult as it might look. Or if it is difficult, here's the steps that you go through. If it is difficult, here's the people you can work with. Um, but you know, I, I, I hope that we see a lot more Ghanaian products in the UK in the years ahead. Um, it's, a, it's a big hope of mine. And as I said, I've, during my time here, we have really focused on bilateral trade. And bilateral trade is, by its very definition, two-way. And we've seen significant growth in the overall bilateral trade, but within that, even greater growth of Ghanaian exports into the UK. And I really believe that's good for you Ghana. You believe that the opportunities are, are better now than before? Or, um so, look, I think, they, I, I think they probably are better than before. You know, I think that, that, and one of the reasons they're probably better than before is that we are coming out of a, a COVID pandemic. Mm -hmm. And we've seen huge suppression of demand, um, people buying things. Uh, and we've seen a UK who's kind of, you know, we absolutely see ourselves as still a part of Europe, if not part of the European mm. Union, and we'll still continue to trade uh, very closely, we hope, with our European friends and neighbours. But I think one of the real things I see about my government's ambition is about talking about kind of global Britain, mm. about engaging with the world, mm. and uh, absolutely as part of that, with our good kind of friends in the Commonwealth, with our long-term relationships that we have in Ghana and elsewhere. So I think... There's a real appetite to be doing uh, more, and I think, it's the, I think it's the scale of our ambition that's holding us back. Yeah, okay, it's good you've spoken about COVID. I'll be taking a short commercial break. When we're back, we'll be looking at, we're talking about COVID, and also what is the UK government doing now to help Ghana and COVID times, and also to help resuscitate our economy going forward, and also uh, Brexit. So what next? And if I am right, this will be one of your last speaking engagement, if I'm not right or wrong on that, because you're bringing your duty service to an end. I'll be getting more on that one. This is PM Express engaging the UK High Commissioner to Ghana, Ian Walker, on what the UK government is doing to support the Ghanaian economy during these times. We'll take a short break. We'll be right back. Welcome back to PM Express Business Edition as we look at the Ghana-UK relationship. And what is the UK government doing to help us as a, a critical development partner in these times of COVID? Mr. William Walker, I mean, let's look at COVID. And, and for you, has it 
put more pressure on you as a development partner to see how you can assist other partners to help manage the pandemic. As some of the world leaders and even others have said that um, I am not safe if others are not safe. Look, I think that's completely, that's the starting point, right? I mean, I think that this has been, uh, a, as you said, a global pandemic. It's a global challenge and there is no answer unless there's a global solution. Um, I, I really believe, and in fact, I don't think it's uh, even disputable now, that unless and until everyone is kind of safe, then no one is safe. You know, we've seen the, the kind of the, the kind of deep and broad effects of COVID in so many countries, certainly including my, my own, mm. where we have, I mean, it's off the scale compared to here, 125,000 people have died mm. uh, of COVID in the UK. We think about 4.2, 4.3 million people have had COVID uh, in the UK. I mean, the numbers are starting. The impact, as you said, on the, er, anyone that's lost their lives is terrible for families. The impact on the economy as things have shut down has been profound and I think is still yet to work its way through the system. On the other side of that, I think the UK, as you say, development partner, I tend to think of us, I hope, as a partner, not just a development partner. I think that we have, I think, a, a profound sense of, um, you know, um, I think belief really in the international system to try and work these challenges through. Uh, and we've tried to do that by doing a number of things in parallel. First of all, by you know, really making sure that this is not about national agendas. This is about making sure that when we were, if you port back to last year, thinking about vaccines, the UK and government invested hundreds of millions of pounds in vaccine research. And we were really pleased at AstraZeneca and Oxford University mm. um, produced, a, produced a vaccine which was low cost and, and kind of transportable. Really important, they were parts of its design. But we were also incredibly pleased that other vaccines came through as well. This is not mm. a competition. Mm. I mean, what's good about the fact that there are different people looking at this is that we're talking about a global challenge here. We need to make sure that absolutely we pull together and do that. So, so as well as kind of investing so much in vaccines in the first instance, we also wanted to try and get the structure right last year, which was involving COVAX, which we now see rolling out here. And COVAX, the UK played a leading role in the kind of establishment of COVAX, making sure that even before vaccines were kind of discovered, that we were going to commit to distributing vaccines equitably. Um, and COVAX, as you know, um, you know, commits to 20%, uh, meeting 20% of kind of the, the kind of 92 least developed countries, what we kind of call it, but 92 countries to meet 20% of their requirement for COVAX, which is therefore funded by, uh, you know, Partners. And in the case of the UK, we funded that by £550 million. Pounds. So that's on top of the hundreds of millions that we've kind of invested into the vaccine development in the first case. On top of that, we then put aside £550 million pounds, uh, to make sure that once it was ready, it can be rolled out. And it was one of the reasons why, I mean, and other partners did the same, I should be clear. You know, the UK, I think, is the second largest uh, donor in the world, but other partners around the world did the same. The US have done a great deal, so have uh, many others. But that's why I'm so pleased to see COVAX arrive here in Ghana at the start of March, as we can see that rollout now starting to, to happen. You know, it's part of clearly a global effort to make sure that, you know, once we start to see numbers coming down, mm -hmm. then one hopes that we can start to see some kind of resumption of normal life. It will take time for that to kind of come back in. But, you know, in the UK just now, you know, to be clear, people are still living in lockdown. Mm -hmm. um, so. Uh, you know, if, if you were in the UK at the moment, you'd be kind of working from home, staying at home. Mm. Um, and if you don't stick to the rules, you're faced with very significant mm. fines. But, but the good thing is that you had your Prime Minister indicating of a, a, a rollout plan where from yeah. is it June or July, it's time to be corrected, Absolutely. there will be the gradual reopening of the economy as well. Absolutely. So I think we are now, we're now through, we hope, to a different phase in the UK, which is that with, uh, with so much of the vaccine kind of rolled out, with numbers now falling very, very significantly in terms of positive cases, we are now looking at opening up the economy. So as children are now back at school, we hope in the next kind of couple of weeks we'll start to see more uh, retail open up and such like. So we've been in a much firmer lockdown than we've seen in Ghana, but we're now starting to see that opening up and we hope and expect to see quite, I think, an, an extensive, I hope, economic uh, recovery on the back mm. of that. Mm. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the the key for the UK and for all partners now, I think, is making sure that we 
must not take our eye off the ball. You know, vaccine rollout, whilst it's going well, has a very, very long way to go. Mm. Uh, we want to make sure that we really do, uh, you know, remove the kind of the, the, the challenges that COVID mm. has presented to so mm. many of us mm. around mm. the world. The last time I spoke to you, you, you talked about the commitment of the UK government to this uh, COVAX programme. Um, Ghana is not the only developing country that has made a request for this. But do I see another COVAX coming to Ghana where the UK government is part of that support? Or so this yeah. is just the last that we've got to because there are a lot of countries out there. Oh, no, no, who no, no. So, the, so the, the amount that's arrived already is 600,000. Yeah. Um, but no, in the next kind of few weeks, there will be an extra million, two million, and that will rise to about, I think, about six million by the end for Ghana. of the Yes, for Ghana by the end of the year. Uh, and the same thing is happening, you know, just uh, last week in Cote d'Ivoire. There was a similar kind of, um, you know, um, arrival of, of vaccine there. Uh, we're seeing it in, in Senegal. We're seeing it all over, uh, all over the kind of all over the world now. As Covax is now starting to kind of roll out. So, no, it's not just about Ghana. But Ghana was importantly the first mm, in the world, mm, and I think that's mm. a real, a real testament to the Ghana Health Service, to the Minister of Health, uh, and so many others for getting such a good plan in place early and by kind of establishing that plan, establishing that sense of grip then they were able to kind of present to COVAX what that plan was and they were able to then get that clear. In, in supporting this whole COVAX program again it's about how a lot of the economies in these developing economies can recover quickly just like what we've seen in UK and even Israel as well. One critical thing that uh, this vaccine deployment is struggling is the acceptance as well. Mm. I mean uh, we've seen some figures being put out by the Ghana, Ghana Health Service as well just two days ago I mean, as a development partner and being a promoter of this whole COVAX program, are you satisfied with what you've seen in terms of the acceptance? Or you think that a lot more needs to be done to let people appreciate about the effectiveness of this vaccine? Mm. Look, I think it's an ongoing, it's going to be an ongoing conversation. All I would say is that, uh, you know, to be aware, I have not yet been offered the vaccine. I'm not yet, uh, I'm not yet kind of uh, been deemed at risk. But I, as soon as I'm offered the vaccine, I will take it, period. Mm. I wouldn't think twice about mm. it. Um, I know, as I'm sure many other people must know, I know countless people um, who have had COVID. It is not the flu. It is not a kind of cold that you pass away. It has different impacts on different people. But I just simply would not think twice about it. I would have the vaccine uh, straight uh, away. That said, I, I, what I'm really conscious of is that you know, we're seeing it in the UK. Um, we had a huge take-up uh, initially in, 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 in the UK, and we still do have very high take-up, I should say. And I think the number of deaths has probably kind of shocked people into that. Um, but I'm sure it's a conversation that will continue in the UK, and I can see it happening here. Um, it just strikes me as something that's going to go down to education. You know, I hear so many kind of myths. Um, I hear things choice. about, you know, things like, does it affect fertility? You know, there is no evidence at all. Of, of the vaccine affecting fertility. Um, you see concerns about, you know, is the information kind of what we think it is? Well, you know, the, these vaccines have been tested extensively. Um, the information, the data is public. Um, I, I, I just, I, as I said, I, I personally, I would have no uh, doubts at all um, about taking the vaccine and my family have, uh, and when my opportunity comes, I will uh, as well. But I think, the conversation matters, yeah, because I think that acceptance comes from people having doubts. If people are having doubts, I think that's fair enough. Have the doubts, we have the conversation. But I think that there is no scientific basis uh, that I can think of. There's no credible argument I've heard of that would suggest people should have a concern. We're talking about recovery of the Ghanaian economy, and we've seen the role of these vaccines in other economies. We've also seen the role of a stimulus program in maybe let's say US and all the rest. For a developing country like Ghana, what would you recommend? Do you think that the vaccine approach could be one of the surest ways in aiding in the recovery of the economy or a stimulus approach could be better because there are still some businesses out there who are saying that listen, we need support from government, cash bailout, uh, reliefs and all the rest or a mix of the two for a country like Ghana? Well, I think one of the things that I think Ghana has done very well is the, is the management, is the response to COVID. Um, and I think that, you know, we talk about kind of interventions and such like, and, you know, it's not really not for me to comment extensively on these matters, but I think you, know, you have seen the government do things around 
supporting provision of kind of water and electricity and such like to people. And I, I, I think that's, I hope my understanding is to the people I've spoken to that has been kind of well received, particularly as there has been an impact on the economy. You know, I think that's kind of clear. Uh, but it's also clear that you know, the way that COVID is presented in Ghana has been different than it has been, say, in the UK, and yeah. the kind of measure, it's a different dynamics, there's different reasons why the approaches would be slightly different. Um, but I think the thing that you kind of say is absolutely right is, you know, as part of a strategy to, you know, building back better, I suppose, after, after COVID, then one assumes that vaccines must be part of that. Um, not in and of themselves, but because, you know, what, what, a, what, a, what an economy is built on, they're built on confidence. And I think that with, I think one of the big things COVID has done is affect confidence. People can't go places, they can't go out, they can't kind of, they can't live their normal life, they can't travel, they can't, you know, supply chains have been kind of shrunk. These kind of things are things that I think as the world starts to kind of hopefully reboot, uh, the world economy starts to hopefully reboot in the next kind of period ahead. And I think that will take some time. But I think Ghana will want to be ready to step into that to make sure that, uh, you know, that the confidence can kind of grow and that the economy can benefit on the back of it. So I do think vaccines mm. form mm. a really important part mm -hmm. of that. So sure. you look at still market intervention and also the deployment of the vaccine as what well, would do the trick for us in fast-tracking the recovery of the economy. So I think it's, it's a mixture of things and I guess we'll all look forward to the budgets, um, you know, which the government will present shortly. And clearly I think the, the trade-off in many economies, including in Ghana, is the kind of extent to which one, well, governments must, I guess, balance the sense of stimulating the economy, which costs money, versus enhancing increasing debt, which therefore increases future kind of debt uh, and repayment kind of liabilities. So I think there are trade-offs, and I, uh, I have the deepest respect for those that, uh, that occupy those positions of power, but these, there are trade-offs that countries have to make. Um, but I think in the, in the UK, as I look at what we've done, there's been a very significant stimulus and now the economy is kind of, we hope to see it kind of kick-starting a bit more. Uh, and as we see that kind of move, then we'll have to make further policy choices mm -hmm. uh, down the line. So I think it's, it's always going to be a combination of those things. Mm. You talked about the budget, and for you, what, would this, what should this budget do after the presentation? I mean, yes, they'll, they'll do the presentation and everything and all those things, but post-presentation, what should be the focus or the direction some would say walking the fine policies that government has spoke about about moving beyond uh, okay, post COVID 19 recovering the economy the president has talked about when he had the pediatric meeting with the cabinet that that would be the focus mm. beyond away this presentation what should be the fine line for us to see the recovery that we are all looking forward to even though you might leave you still have one eye on Ghana to see how things are going. Well, look, I'm not leaving um, until June, so I'm, I'm still here <laughs> for, a, uh, for, a, for a little bit, for a little bit yet. Um, and so I'm not thinking of, not quite in kind of leaving uh, mode uh, yet, but when that time comes, you know, I think, uh, I think once Ghana gets in your heart, it doesn't leave. So I don't think I'll be, uh, even if I, if I depart physically, I think uh, mentally I'll still be keeping an eye and hopefully keeping connected with so many of my kind of good friends here. Look, I think that the, the big, I think the government set its path about what it was looking to do and it was elected on that kind of mandate. And I think the big challenge the government has now is making sure it delivers on that, on that mandate. I think that kind of commitment to kind of greater economic growth, to the diversification of the economy, to kind of enabling more kind of value add and a lot of the production, whether that's in agric or whether that's in kind of other areas of, of the economy, of, of dealing with some of the energy challenges that the government has kind of, you know, has been dealing with in the last few years. And from a UK perspective, I want to kind of see, you know, more and more uh, UK participation in areas like digitisation. Um, I think there's a lot where we can do on things like, you know, renewables and talking about not just uh, the short term focus, but in the medium term focus as we talk about the kind of the, the climate impacts that we see around the world. How do we make sure that uh, as as many countries around the world talk about becoming more green, clearly finance in that kind of area is going to become much more attractive. How do we make sure that Ghana can kind of you know, lean into that and, and take the benefit of some of that as well? It really kind of excites me. Um, but it's really clear, I suppose, that if there's one thing that strikes me when I think about the Guinean economy, it's that people want jobs. It's about jobs. How, do we, how, does, how does the country create more and more jobs? And that really, I guess, it depends on one's own perspective, but that's not always the government, that's the private sector. Uh, so for me, it's how do you kind of stimulate more private sector 
kind of capability, more private sector involvement, more private sector kind of driving the innovation agenda? And how do you help the private sector work with um, the private sector around the world, um, including in the UK, not just the UK, of course, but including the UK, so that we're starting to see those kind of flows of capital, where I think there's plenty of capital in London, mm -hmm. lots of projects here, um, and vice versa kind of applies. So we want to see more investments. Um, but the tying up on the kind of sense of partnership is what I think excites me, and which I'm, I'm really confident and hopeful for, that we can kind of drive through the very active diaspora that we have. And when we think of diaspora, that's not just television stars or mm. football stars, important as they all are, <laughs> but it's about the kind of Ghanaian diaspora that work in the city of London, that work in banking, that work in energy, that work in the healthcare services, that work in... These are people who have got a foot in either, in both countries, and how we kind of draw on their knowledge, draw on their experience, and really kind of drive what we know Ghana wants and what the UK wants, and the same thing, and it's that kind of sense of opportunity, mutual prosperity, growth, and I hope the kind of, into the very, very long term, the sense of, you know, good relations, like-minded countries, I think with the values that we risk mm -hmm. taking for granted, mm -hmm. making mm -hmm. sure they remain mm -hmm. front, middle mm -hmm. and centre. Mm -hmm. And you're talking about jobs, I mean, that should, what a budget post-presentation should also do as well, since it is quite critical for you. But look, I think that, you know, that with, with jobs comes people one hopes who also pays tax mm -hmm. and as people pay tax mm -hmm. then you start to find a way of making sure investment happens in the economy as you see more and more investment in the economy then you start to see kind of you know things like infrastructure improving around the country particularly as Ghana moves beyond aid you know things like you know, new roads that we know people care about they've got to be paid for from somewhere so more jobs creates that kind of opportunity and I know you know it sounds mothered in apple pie but it's this kind of sense of uh, Keeping it simple matters, attracting investment matters, but actually we know that the more people that are in work, then clearly the more kind of the direction of travel feels like a positive mm. one. Ian Walker is the High Commissioner to UK High Commissioner to Ghana. And Ian, I would also be getting your, your thoughts as well as what do we need to do as a country, as Ghana, as businesses, to attract the required capital from UK? What do the UK business want from a Ghanaian partner as well? And, uh, talk about uh, life after Ghana as well. And what are your fondest memories in leaving Ghana as well? This is PM Express Business Edition. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back to PM Express Business Edition. As you look, what role can the UK government play in helping in the recovery of the Ghanaian economy and work as UK High Commissioner to Ghana. Ian, I was trying to ask you about what do the typical UK investor want so that we can attract the required capital since you're talking about capital. What do you want? Or what do they want? So look, I think that when I boil it down to the kind of the simplest summary I can think of, I think that uh, when I look at London, not just the UK, but in this case London, I think there is uh, an excess of capital. I think that there are historically low interest rates, which mean that there is a set of capital that's looking for projects. Mm -hmm. I think when I look at Ghana, I see a lot of projects that are looking for capital. And I think that the challenge we have is how do we bring those two things together? And I think the third leg of the stool is that because of our commitment to uh, development, our kind of generations of long commitment to development, uh, and our focus on how to use things like concessional finance, how to use development finance, so UK government often backed finance. How do we draw that money in to bridge that gap, to try and close the gap between the sense of capital coming to projects and vice versa? And that's been, in the simplest sense, I think what we are trying to kind of do. The kind of investors that I uh, talk with, many of them, I think, they, they see Ghana as a you know, first of all, a very, very welcoming country. It's kind of, obviously, as you know, it's English speaking. The, the legal system is based on the same uh, principles. Um, so there's lots of positives. It's a natural place to come. I think that in practice, I think some companies love working here. The ones that kind of end up either maybe coming but not following through, uh, the, the kind of more challenging things are often that it's kind of harder, it can be harder to get things done here than sometimes people imagine. So it can take longer to kind of execute uh, deal. So the kind of sense of the ease of doing business. And I'm sure, I say that without kind of, uh, without being critical, because I'm sure there must be reasons that cut the other way uh, back as well. But the feedback I have is that kind of sense of, 
uh, turning an idea to make sure that it comes into reality, that kind of time to execution, I think, could be, could be quicker. And that kind of sense of what are the real priorities. Um, so w when we talk about investing in any particular sector, what particularly are the things that really, really matter? And if we can be really clear about the priorities, then we can organise uh, around it. You know, in, in the case of the UK, I think that, you know, for those that don't know the UK that well, I mean, you know, <laughs> the, the connection of government is, mu government is much less involved in the private sector in the UK than mm -hmm. it would be, say, here. There, there, is a, there is a much clearer separation. So often, investors are not the government. Yeah. Sometimes it's the government, but often it's the private sector. And the, so therefore, what we're looking to do with the High Commission is to bring investors here more than necessarily the government investing. And sometimes it's a combination of the two. So being really clear about its prior priorities helps us kind of then um, really invest not just our effort, but our Ghanaian interlocutor's effort into really making things happen. And it's kind of why we really kind of created the UK Ghana Business Council, which we set up uh, you know, about three years ago. And it's, it's been something I think I'm really really proud of and the vice presidents and, and so many of the kind of ministers in the economic management team have been have been brilliant because uh, it's really helped us prioritize really helped us kind of get things kind of moving um, so that we can understand okay when we say we want to do more on you know pick your sector then you can start to dig a bit deeper or if you want the UK government to be doing more you know then where and how so you know and, and that kind of straddles everything from UK support into kind of education uh, UK support into tax reform right through into trying to find investors into major infrastructure programs mm -hmm. here. So how we bring those together is kind of the thing. Mm -hmm. Apart from COVAX, uh, again, and, and, and during these times, again, what uh, else is the UK government doing to help Ghana apart from that? So with particular regards to COVID, and we're doing a lot more than COVAX. Um, so we have, we reorientated our £6 million a year program that we spent on health to focus exclusively uh, on COVID, so working with the Ghana Health Service and others. Um, we have done a lot of training um, of, uh, of kind of health workers in, in the northern part of the country, uh, using kind of health workers from the UK as the kind of connecting point and investing and supporting things like public health messaging. We've also on the broader economic side, working through the G20, so the group of 20 biggest economies. UK led the kind of calls to make sure that there was a suspension of kind of debt interest mm. repayments, um, so it was about thirteen billion pounds of, of debt this, of debt repayments that were kind of paused um, until we got out of the kind of the, the heat of the crisis. So mm. again, creating breathing space for economies to make sure that they can focus on their own mm -hmm. domestic response. We've done things such as you know, I think in fact some of the things I think I'm most kind of. Uh, the greatest pride mm. in, I think, it, mm. it is some of the brilliant stuff that was done that wasn't actually even done about COVID two or three years ago. Mm. So we've, our focus on economic development meant that we invested in, uh, in kind of manufacturing in places such as kind of CAD, two or three other kind of companies as well, who, when COVID struck, they kind of effectively kind of turned on the head of a pin, stopped doing what they were previously producing and started to produce face masks. Mm. And were then selling face masks across the country. So, inst you know, so instead of, you know, another country coming and dropping in PPE, Ghana quickly turned around and said, actually, no, we can produce a lot of this stuff ourselves. And that was from, you know, so th these are kind of investments that were made years ago into companies that are now, they're Ghanaian owned, Ghanaian kind of staffed, Ghanaian run, producing PPE for Ghanaians are so much more sustainable, I think, than us, you know, spending, that's just not what Ghana wants, it's not what the UK wants. And it's a great example of actually, if we continue to invest in each other, with a real focus on the long term, actually we can see some UK change. is part of our development partners that champion this whole uh, debt relief during these uh, COVID times and all the rest. Uh, one would ask, so one can t talk about the fact that even talk about, again, countries like Ghana signing up for a COVAX debt relief as well. Mm -hmm. Do you think that Ghana should take it up? Or maybe, well, we are a developing economy, so maybe, well, we shouldn't. Well, I think these are questions really for the government of Ghana. Mm. I think it's not really uh, for me to say. I mean, I think the, there have been some uh, kind of uh, kind of lower income countries who, who have looked to that. I guess Ghana's in that middle ground where it's a lower middle income country. So actually, you know, Ghana is still very successfully, you know, th there's real confidence, I think, in the economy of Ghana. Um, we've seen that with recent kind of, you know, uh, bond issues. In fact, we've seen 
other bond issues on the on the on the in, in, in the subregion recently that also attracted lots of interest post COVID. So there's lots of confidence in Ghana. I think so. The the, the question I think for policymakers here will be the extent to which uh, Ghana can manage its way out of this uh, through its own kind of economic decisions and the extent to which it has to then look to to international partners. Um, but these are going to be big policy decisions that I think mm. the government of Ghana will have to consider. There's talk about yeah. Africa rising, there's talk about Ghana rising. What should Ghana be doing to take its rightful role in the continent as not just a political giant but an economic giant as well? Well, I think I mean I think the I think the president's uh, the government's kind of ability to kind of bring the AFCFTA secretariat is a really good example of like, starting to bring some of that kind of decision making into a crab, which is I think a, a really kind of big uh, step forward. I think we've heard the president talk before about the importance not just of the secretariat and its role, but the actually the importance of kind of trade across the subcontinent. It strikes me Ghana's in a very good place to try and you know benefit from so much of that. Um, as again, you know, you asked earlier about uh, investors, and I think that scale always is a question for investors. You know, look at the size of the markets, uh, and clearly, as markets become more and more joined up, then the opportunity for investment grows considerably. So, I think, um, look, I think this, I think, I think people will look, f people in Ghana should be looking forward optimistically to what can come. But as ever, it always requires a good grip on the finances of the country, a good grip on the economy, and. Uh, you know, in my mind, really kind of letting the private sector mm -hmm. flourish. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and as you wrap our interview up on this PM Express, I mean, uh, you, you're bringing your duty tour to an end uh, June this year. How would you describe, you've been here for four yeah. years? Yeah, four years. How would you describe this uh, duty tour compared to other places that you've been, not to mention the names of the countries though? <laughs> so look, I've, uh, I think Ghana is an absolutely fabulous country um, and I have, I have, uh, great, great confidence that it's going to, you know, continue its kind of, I hope its growth story, continue its kind of, uh, continue I think and I hope it's kind of focus on its values, continue its democratic traditions, continue its close friendship with the UK and so many other kind of countries that, that we all that we all know well. Um, I, I find it to be a professionally stimulating experience but, but socially magnificent. I've really enjoyed getting to know um, Ghanaians, um, what people stand for. And I think this kind of entrepreneurial spirit that I see in so many people, by which I don't mean just big businesses, I mean, you know, the, um, I mean the kind of, you know, the woman on the street corner that sells you Kofi Brokman, you know, I think that the kind of sense of entrepreneurial spirit that I just think is, is great. And I, and, I, and I want to tap into that. And I, so, so to your point of, yes, I'll be moving on, um, but you know the, the the strength between the UK and Ghana still moves. It's clearly uh, clearly the government to government relations is important, and I wouldn't want to underplay that for a moment. It's really important, but it's also about the people to people connections. And you know, having lived here for four years, and my children having spent you know my youngest child having spent the majority of his life uh, in Ghana, um, you know, it's going to be a big part of our lives, and therefore I think I regard myself as part of that that constituency. What will be your, your your fondest memories as you leave here? So many. I mean, it's really hard to pick out one or two. But I mean, best I think two. The best two. I mean, like my cycle ride, I loved um, because I could kind of just see people, speak to people, understand what was on their minds, see the country and, uh, and its beauty. Um, and I think the the other one that stands out to me was, um, in fact, Independence Day about two years ago when we went up to up to the north of the country for three or four days, and I went to kind of Navrongo, and I went to Yendi, and some of those kind of experiences. When I think the the, the pride, the culture, the kind of the, the food, the music, the style, the energy, I love that. And it, it just is a good reminder that, you know, because countries are friends, because countries know each other, because they're close, it doesn't mean you have to, come, have to become the same. It means you have to absolutely celebrate the differences mm. uh, and celebrate the diversity. And that was a hugely uh, wonderful experience and I've had many, many more besides. So. So yeah, look, I think it's been, a, it's been the privilege of a lifetime to, to do this job, but I think that even when I finish, I suspect I won't finish. What will be your low? Okay. Your lowest point, if there's any? Lowest point? Look, COVID has been tough. I don't think we could pretend otherwise. I think, you know, um, I think COVID has been really tough, that kind of sense of uncertainty that stuck around everybody, and that, that kind of, I can really remember visibly, there's kind of, you know, a couple of weeks when 
we all felt, crikey, what on earth is going on? Um, we're trying to kind of all work our way around and kind of scrabble around to provide a plan. Um, so I think that's probably the lowest point. Um, but I think and I hope that, you know, uh, actually through adversity comes strength. And th having faced down COVID, mm. I think the resilience that I saw in my team in the High Commission is something that I am probably so proud of. Um, and it's worth remembering that people often think of the High Commission and they think of the High Commissioner. But actually in our, in our staff, 80% of my team are Ghanaian. And the, the way that they work together, that real sense of pride in our mission, um, it's probably the proudest moment, I think, of what we've seen. So probably out of the hardest bit, arguably came the best bit. Your final words for government, final words for the people, and final words for businesses and entrepreneurs that have excited you so much, Ian. But look, I think the next four years are huge, you know, after the first four years um, of, of uh, the President's government, I think this next four years is about delivery. And that means that, you know, me, my successor, UK government, UK private sector, we need to step up. So too does Ghana, and we need to keep on raising that sense of ambition and really make sure we deliver on, uh, on creating and growing that sense of uh, relationship and kind of growth that we all want to see. So yeah, look forward to that. Mm. Entrepreneurs? And entrepreneurs, of course. Mm -hmm. Lean in. Ian Walker is the UK High Commissioner to Ghana. It's been great uh, engaging you with us in one of you. It might be one of your last media interviews before you leave, if not the <laughs> last one as well, Ian. I appreciate it so much. And this has been PM Express Business Edition as we looked at how the UK government is helping or is helping or what they are doing to help in aiding the Ghanaian economy to revive in these times. My name is George Yafe. Have a great day.